That's C major. Yeah. And that's gay and warlike. I know I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not gay and warlike at all. Yeah. So the only thing I know about classical music at the moment is that I like Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky, and that's basically because of Billy Elliot. But I want to know more. So today I'm at the Philharmonia, and that's because I'm going to meet gay bassist Adam, who's going to teach me a little bit more about classical music and why I should care about it. Is it quite physically enduring as, a, as an instrument to play? It's pretty demanding, yeah, like it's, it can be. Especially these um, sort of like loud gay Russian music, the right stuff, they're just like digging the road up where you're just kind of like... <laughs> All this sort of stuff where you're just like literally just scrubbing the hell out of it for <laughs> absolutely eight at a time. You know, so it's... I like that can be. Gay like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You, you draw the best sound by having your bow going sort of like in a in a parallel to the bridge. So that bridge has got a line going that way. Yeah. So your arm needs to be kind of moving in this sort of direction. Okay. On this, this is the hardest point to reach, obviously. You have to have pretty long arms to be able to get right the way out there and keep it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just so like a smaller person, like or someone your size might play a smaller bass so you can like so you can handle it basically. I kind of want to get into classical music, but I still feel this like barrier. Yeah. So the first thing I want to do is, you know, use my queer connection and find some kind of queer classical music. Mm. Where should I start? What should I listen to? Yeah, listen to some Tchaikovsky. Go to a go to a hall. Go and see live music element because that's that's a big thing as well. Seeing it performed. Let's talk about Tchaikovsky because I'm kind of fascinated by his story, right? Yeah, we're talking about. I can't remember which piece we're playing, but it's like any Tchaikovsky is always like they've got these sort of like angsty moments and that. So um, there was some sort of attempt to relate how that came from him being an, an out, a different person. So it's like, oh yeah, and um, and Tchaikovsky he struggled because he was. Sexually different. It is this moment where people start like looking at roll, eyebrows, eyes rolling, and eyebrows. Rolling. Just say gay. Just say he's gay. We all know he's gay. You know. He has quite a colourful kind of like queer life, personal story as well, yeah. right? Alongside his music, because mm. he had a wife. Yeah. But then they didn't really get on. Yeah, it's all like kind of just trying to make it work according to what you could and couldn't be seen to be doing at the time. I think in like. Um, mid late nineteenth century, yeah, Russia basically. And let's so, face it, it's not yeah. to be gay in Russia now, is it? So like that representation is important, especially when you know, like I think in two thousand and thirteen, there was the Russian secretary that, can I could say completely, Tchaikovsky was not gay. There's no mm, proof of it. Yeah, and that erases like a big part of what is essentially yeah. well known history, right? Yeah, it's funny because um, with that music that's written by outsiders, I think it always has a certain kind of weight. So we can hear Tchaikovsky's sixth symphony now. It premiered just nine days before his mysterious death from cholera, aged just 53. Speculation is actually rife over whether it's a musical suicide note. And that's in part because many people can hear in the melody the story of him working out his sexuality before having to repress it due to social pressures in the 17th century. First movement, sort of like uncertainty, but then moments of, you know, kind of quite passionate sort of you know, depth of feeling coming out. There's um, a quite sort of whimsical, sort of unusual, uh, unusual uh, second movement because he's right. So the main tune with five beats in a bar, which is like just not the done thing around that side of time. It's all about kind of twos and fours and threes and you know, kind of regular things like that. So it's it's, it's kind of like a waltz with a limp sort of thing. It's, so that's unusual. Then you have this sort of like unusually sort of like over the top kind of bombastic march, and then like extreme sorrow in the last movement, sort of fading away. So absolutely. You know, despair. You change, don't you? When you get older, you don't. You stop, stop looking without, and then you wonder if a person like Tchaikovsky was censored all the time and couldn't really live authentically. Probably just got stuck in that tragic sort of first phase where all these feelings are swirling around, but you can't really do anything about it. It's just, just constant angst. So it's it's kind of sad to think about how that might have been 
the driving force behind the creation of a piece like that. The Sixth Symphony is potentially about that mm. otherness. He then also did this piece of music, you know, around the Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah. Which is arguably one of the most famous heterosexual <laughs> yeah. stories of all time. How did he manage to nail that? Well, I don't know, because I mean, you have to be so careful when it comes to like saying who can do what. And I think there's the idea of empathy has to kind of reign supreme in these discussions, because anyone can understand the depth of feeling that comes from a romance. Well, actually, it makes perfect sense that someone like him would make, you know, make something really amazing out of it. I would say that would be my response to. And then actually, that. you know, like you've got that whole concept of like the forbidden love, which I guess yeah, 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 too, right? yeah, 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 completely. Mm. So it's always about the yeah, yeah. I keep saying that the outsider is, is going to have a unique thing which can be kind of cathartic for everyone. So in an orchestra of 80, how yeah. many LGBT people were kind of uh, roughly in the... the? Roughly half a dozen, half I'd dozen. say, players. Okay. I'm just picture there, it's going to be, yeah, so lucky. It's like, is that, is that right? So half of them have left now, I mean, oh. so it's not recent, he's Wait, retired. Wait, so you in the picture? I am, yeah, just, if you see that, um, so there's a front row of bases yeah. there. Oh yeah. I haven't got my little beard, so like, I'm... This I'm, is you're here, right? Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So that's like, it. do you have like a bit of a like, kind of camaraderie with the other kind of LGBT players? Well, there's just like, there's always a, there's always that thing, like, I don't know what you'd call it, but there's like, people are just sort of like aware of each other, aren't you? And you have you like, it's just like, unless you know, you've got your mates and people you hang out with, and then some of them happen to be, um, you know, LGBT people. And there's a, there's one other gay bass player that comes in, but it's not a member, but he's around quite often. One of the other permanent guys is as well. So you, you just have your chats about. All of the bass players. No, yeah, there's, there's um, <laughs> we, we're joking about it, saying like, <laughs> well, Welcome to the gayest base section in London <laughs> that we've <have> got. <laughs> Why does this guy have described it like that? It's from 1682 when they didn't have a standardised way of um, having all having 12 equal tones on a, on a keyboard necessarily. You might have um, a way of tuning it so that certain keys sounded good and all the notes rang nicely together, but the ones that you didn't use that often wouldn't be quite well in tune. Right. So, um, and he obviously you see Major a lot because he's very happy about it. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>